Um, I've thought about this too, actually. I think there is room in the market for a documentary, we'll, we'll call it, that explains money from first principles, explains why gold was selected, explains how governments co-opted gold and how Bitcoin sort of restores balance. Um, and I, I mean, I'm no, I'm no filmmaker, <laughs> but I think that the thing that gets people really passionate and inspired about Bitcoin is that it is disruptive to global war. Like you actually, you study the history of money and it is intimately intertwined with the history of warfare. Like people have been fighting and killing and deceiving each other over the money for as long as we've been walking, right? It's, it's really, it's really bad. Um, and I think that's how you mobilize people too, because nobody, no civilization likes war, right? They get ideologically twisted into it. Um, and we talked about this a bit on the podcast last night, but I really think there are quite effective dark arts being practiced at the geopolitical level to pull the ideological streams of humanity, right? They know how to kind of pluck this right here, pull this here, always getting people to look away from the root cause to distract them with any social symptom. Um, but I, I, I do think that people in general could would more or less agree and cons, you know consensual. That's another point of general um, consensus in the world is that warfare is not good, right? It's just not good. It's, it's very anti-economic, it's culturally destructive. It leaves scars, intergenerational scars. Um, I think that's the story that needs to be told. It's like Bitcoin is disruptive to gold, government and global warfare. And all, those, all three of those are very intimately connected, right? Government as we know it only exists because it's monopolized gold Gold only exists because of its monetary properties in the free market. Bitcoin is disruptive to, it better satisfies the properties of money by a hundred, possibly a thousand X than gold. So it's literally pulling a rug up from under this whole, you know, in many ways, the whole history of humanity. Hey, how you all doing? Welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Davani, the Total Connector. I'm really excited to get with my co-host Stephanie von Jan to announce my next special talk with Robert Breedlove. Uh, most people, most of my listeners know him already. I mean, he's a brilliant, phenomenal writer. He goes to the essence, the soul of Bitcoin, you know, understanding of, you know, money and slavery, uh, which is, uh, which, uh, again, uh, you should read his latest article from July 5th on medium.com slash at Breedlove22, which is also his Twitter handle, Breedlove22. It's called Masters and Slaves of Money. And uh, so if you haven't read it yet, please read it not only once, but twice, three times, uh, you know, as often as pos possible, because you go really down the rabbit hole into the comprehension process of what it really means, what kind of reality we're really living in with the central banking system, governments and the fiat money. So um, this is, of course, you know, a prelude to the podcast episode, which I'm doing right now a day after. What I didn't know uh, was after, afterwards, once I was once we were finished with the recording yesterday on 26th of September, uh, American Hoddle posted or tweeted uh, that they're actually working together. He, American Hoddle and Robert Real have actually started working or whatever, are planning to work on an independent doc documentary. And that was actually one of my core questions, how Robert Breedlove would visualize, like what would be the, the first few minutes or as a teaser, the trailer to, you know, make people understand, comprehend, uh, like feel and, and really, you know, get the bigger picture of what it would mean to live in a Bitcoinized world, in a free private cities, in, you know, in, um, in a, in a deflationary economics with deflationary technologies, with totally new, you know, uh, uh, freedom structures. Um, so yeah, so this is actually, you know, was my main um, uh, uh, question to him. So uh, 
so what we're going to discuss is, first of all, understanding the root problem of the problems in the world, namely fiat slavery money. Fiat money destroys the moral uh, of not only the elite, but also the enslaved. Fiat is slavery. Bitcoin is freedom. Details on the calculation of hours stolen by the Fed through money printing, and that's astronomically high. But uh, we'll go more into details. Inflation is systematic, simply theft, right? It's criminal. Then we'll talk, we're going to talk about decentralization of the state and in a manipulate market preferences are not communicated. One votes with one's buying decision. Money is time and energy. Fiat money leads to war and slavery. Prices reveal important information on the preferences of the people. Then we're going to talk about distorting natural price discovery and manipulation of the collective logos is equivalent to perverting the vox populi, the voice of the people. Then we're going to talk about uh, uh, finally about gold versus Bitcoin. Bitcoin is 100 or even 1000 times superior. And if every country had a citadel, where would you go, Robert? So these are the questions we're going to ask him and much more. So without further ado, I'm hoping uh, before uh, we start with um, with the episode, um, I'm hoping we're going to do this together, like really add, uh, really add up to one another and do this as a joint venture project and together with, uh, with, you know, with our group, with a lot of other Bitcoiners so that, you know, I mean, it's, you know, it's, I find it super that everybody's like, you know, doing their own thing, but if we can like, you know, fuse it into one evolutionary film that touches, you know, the minds, the souls, the comprehension process and, uh, you know, 8 billion people around this planet, this is going to be it. But we know, uh, we need, as soon as we have some kind of, you know, multiplicators or some kind of pre-funding, then, you know, I can, uh, connect to all these people I know in the film industry, uh, film business, you know, whether it's in the United States or anywhere, and then we can get really huge funding, crowdfunding, maybe even additionally, or, or just, you know, co-executive producers. So we would need, you know, a lot of help on any level you can think of. If you want to support us, contribute to the film project, please DM me or email me at hello at the film connector.com. So without further ado, I'm really excited to announce together with Stephanie von Jan, my co moderator and co host, Robert Breedlove. Alrighty, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Davan in Total Connect. I'm so pleased and excited to announce my two very special guests, Robert Breedlove, need no, int no introduction, and Stephanie von Jan doesn't either need no introduction. But still, um, we um, let's just kick it off by saying a few words before we um, go into depth. Um, Stephanie, you know, I, there's a specific reason, Robert, why I wanted the three of us or the two of us actually, you know, have this discussion um, on this specific question, like uh, which the title of the of, of our of this episode suggests uh, the crossroads or on the crossroads of serfdom, slavery and freedom, which most people don't want to accept the word slavery, which I heard in one of your interviews now recently, people rather accept sort of the terminology time theft which makes total sense, right? So uh, I think I speak for both of us. We we love your work. It's phenomenal. You, you know, it's not only articulated and poetic, but you really, I think once you start reading, once like anybody starts reading your article, I'd have to like read it over and over again because it goes like deeper, deeper into layers. And, and then it goes like into the essence of, you know, um, of yeah, money and slavery. So, uh, Stephanie, why don't you just start off and ask those questions which you had prepared, and then I'll go into the, the core question, which I want to address to Robert. Thank you so much. Yeah, so first, Robert, thank you so much for this amazing article. I really loved it, how you brought together like um, the slavery aspect in contrast with freedom, and also what makes us human, essentially and what makes us self-sovereign beings. And you were connecting this of the God spark within us. And I really like that you made this big, this picture like more bigger. And I saw that you're now writing on uh, money, time and soul. So you're really bringing all these aspects together in a holistic view on what human beings are and which 
um, part money plays in it, but in which part also Bitcoin plays in it, because this is the freedom and self-sovereignty technology. So I'm really amazed by your work and I'm thank sure you, thank you so much. Of you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and while we unfortunately saw in the last month that we are going more towards um, let's say a serfdom and um, it's getting more and more oppressive and more and more socialist let's say we have less and less freedoms so um, but on the other hand we have people waking up we have bitcoin we have people forming alliances and thinking on new ideas so um, i actually recently had a talk which was about this topic crossroads between serfdom and freedom because this is a little bit how I perceive it and this is why I would like to ask you how do you perceive it and where do you think are we going into right now? Sure, um, thank you for the kind words. I um, spent a lot of time thinking about this piece before I wrote it and it was actually I saw an art exhibit in December. It was at Art Basel in Miami. And there was a, I think it's maybe the third image in the piece that actually shows a slave ship um, with the, the design plan for how slaves were packed into the ship. And it was at that moment I had this kind of epiphany because I had read um, in both the Bitcoin Standard and some other writings about agribeads and how they were, Europeans were packing holes full of these counterfeit beads into to ship them into Africa and use and pawn them off as a real thing to acquire resources and wealth and whatnot. And um, it just all seemed really timely with kind of the, the social unrest worldwide, which was sparked. Um, you know, it's been going on for a long time here in the US as far as like the police brutality. But all these things, they have their roots in what I would argue is the violation of private property rights. Like even if people don't understand what's going on in an economy, everyone senses that something is wrong, like very deeply wrong. Um, and I think that is, it is central banks printing money that are basically confiscating wealth from people on the bottom. This is, um, that is socialism, right? There is no, there's a non-consensual exchange of value taking place whether or not people are cognizant of it, it's happening. And I think that non-consensual, um, unilateral confiscation of wealth, it's embodied in the socialistic structure we call the central bank, which was Marx's fifth measure in his Communist Manifesto. And it's in the heart of every quote unquote free, car free market capitalist society today. So it's like we, we, we're disillusioned, right? We're delusional actually like to say that we have a capitalist system in the world and that capitalism has failed or people call it even crony capitalism none of these terms make sense because under a true capitalist regime we would not have this centralized monopolized management of money um and i just wanted to try and point people's attention toward what i think is the actual root cause um and hopefully tie that back to the some of the symptoms we see, uh, especially here in the U.S., being the racial tensions and riots. Um, and I, I just, as far as what direction does it go, I mean, I think I make this argument in the piece, too. It's like the only direction society goes when you have an institution of socialism at its heart is it becomes more socialistic, right? Price signals become more and more manipulated. The financial incentives for individuals and companies are to, get, to work um, on behalf of the fiat currency spigot to get as close to that um, sweet, sweet cantillon effect as you can, right? Which is which means moving away from adding value in society toward rent seeking, toward theft, toward um, politicking, all these things that we, you know, it's it's no one. If you ask ask anyone instinctually, like people don't like politicians, people don't like lawyers people don't like economists oftentimes because they are just kind of in this rent seeking mode i'm not not it's not black or white like clearly people add value um across the domain but the fact that that part of the economy has grown so much relative to the real productive economy i think is a testament to um the direction 
society's going and it's it's a further away from free market capitalism uh which is reflected in free exchange further into this realm of involuntary exchange um and it's you know it's corrosive it's corrosive to our moral fabric you know people don't need to understand it people it just it's embodied um embodied knowledge right when you're being robbed all the time it almost gives you an incentive to rob or to try you just have to play the game right you're, you're incentivized to play the game and the game right now the game board is slanted right very he very heavily in favor of those um who own the most capital and that's why bitcoin's important it's a a new game with rules that cannot be bent cannot be changed uh that are free and open for all to see so hopefully this piece uh shines a light on that yeah it certainly did so when you were explaining the wine example where um, because of inflation he would need to double the price of the wine but he does not do so because he would lose customers but instead he reduces the quality of the wine so this was a very and then has um, the same price so this was a very nice example on that um, yeah, so thank you so much on that. So what I also found is um, in the at anatomy of the state by Rothbard, he's mm. explaining that the state is a parasitic entity. So you were more talking about the central banks that are extracting wealth from the lower society. Um, but I'm also like thinking about the state doing so by taxation. And um, now I saw on your homepage then in your mission statement, you say you want to make the state decentralized. How exactly does this look like? Yeah, uh, so first about the winemaker example, I've got to give credit where credit's due. That, I lifted that example from a book called Honest Money by Gary North. Uh, it's available as a free PDF on mycs.org. Gary's book essentially explains, I think he calls it um, explaining banking and money through Christian principles. So he's rooting, it's a great first principle Austrian economic read, but then he's connecting it to biblical principles throughout. So I would say you could read it regardless of your religious uh, standpoint. It's a great book. Um, it's actually one of the books I would give most people that have no knowledge of money or economics whatsoever like he starts from very first principles like robin crusoe on an island what is money what is income what is capital and he builds it all the way up from there um, and then along the way he's just using referencing the bible saying and the bible taught us that here the bible taught us this here so it's really interesting and some people have given me pushback I guess I got to lay out the general example. So the, the, the parable is that there's a winemaker operating in a centrally banked economy. And he knows that his local central bank has just doubled the money supply to quote unquote, save the economy. Um, and he's basically faced with three choices. So the winemaker say he's always traditionally sold his, his wine for $20 a bottle. He can now choose to sell, keep selling it for $20 a bottle. And he would take a 50% loss in post-inflation dollars, right? We're, we're just kind of ignoring the, the spatio-temporal unevenness of inflation. It takes a while to work its way into an economy, and it works its way into different markets at different rates. But we're just saying post-inflation, what are his choices? So he can take, keep selling for $20, take a 50% haircut, because all those dollars have been diluted by half, right? Because they doubled the money supply. Or he could use cheaper ingredients or water down his wine so he could compromise the quality and keep selling it at $20 so he could preserve his profit margin. But in doing so, he'd be deceiving his customers, right? He's selling them an inferior product. And then his third choice is he can double the selling price to $40, right? So he would maintain the same price in post-inflation dollars and maintain his margin while using the same quality of ingredients. And the crazy thing about it is that, so pricing is very visual, right? It's like if a customer is shopping, the first thing they see is your price. If I look at a bottle of wine, I see whether it's 20 or $40. I can't see if it's been watered down or if they, if they use cheaper ingredients. I can maybe detect it with my taste buds and, and whatnot over time. 
but the the price is the most visual aspect of a, of a good or service so vendors never want to increase their price right that's basically wishing away business because customers are going to always look for the the lowest cost item in that quality category so there was a little bit of pushback on this saying that people were saying oh no even in capitalism a pure capitalist, capitalistic system, winemakers always have this incentive to water down wine or use cheaper ingredients. And that is somewhat true, but they, in a purely capitalist system too, you're also trading on your reputation, right? If you sell an inferior product, people wise up to that over time, they'll move away from you. So in an inflationary system, prices of inputs are always increasing nominally because they're increasing the money supply. So the incentive is to actually not increase your price and instead try to hide it in, in the product, which a lot of people call shrinkflation, right? The quality declines or the price stays the same. Whereas in a truly capitalist system, if you're on a gold or Bitcoin standard, prices would actually be decreasing naturally. So as we become smarter and more productive, prices would fall. And that would change the game because decreasing prices would draw business into you. So there'd be this incentive to constantly try to be undercutting your competition. And that's what that's what capitalism does, right? It delivers these high quality products to us at the lowest possible price the market will bear. Um, whereas in this, again, the socialist system, by inflating the money supply, you're incentivizing producers to deceive their customers in the short run. So you're actually increasing their time preference, right? They're trading on their future reputation. And then they're selling inferior products into the marketplace. And then as those customers get screwed over, they in turn are producers for other customers. They now have an incentive because they've traded their hard earned money for something that's inferior to deceive their customers. And so in, in that way, inflation is like this contagious moral disease. And it, it really messes people up. Um, and the fact that, I guess that would be my, my main aim is to try and drive a stake through the heart of that notion that inflation is somehow good or necessary or useful in an economy. Um, it's absolutely not. It is purely a mechanism of non-consensual wealth transfer, AKA theft. That's all it does. And I, I go through the piece, like it, it's a tool, right? Quote unquote, but it can, it's a tool that's only useful for creating wealth inequality. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a central bank and I can create money, I can now increase the wealth inequality between the people that receive the money versus the people that are forced to use the money. And there were examples where Nazi Germany had plans to bomb England with counterfeit pounds. They were trying to induce hyperinflation in their enemy, right? And there were similar experiments run in the Norbido laboratory in Japan where they planned to basically sabotage enemy currency systems. So there's no... And I still encounter smart people today that t will tell me and believe, really believe, we need 2% inflation. We need this for our economy. It's good for wages. It keeps the demand going. Like they're so indoctrinated in this Keynesian hallucination. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I hope that this piece shatters that. And um, I, I forgot the second part of the question, actually. Um, yeah, it was essentially about decentralization of the state, um, whether, uh, how you see that. Yeah, I always point people on this topic to the book, The Sovereign Individual. I think it does the best job of looking forward into a, into a historical pattern we've never seen, right? We've never seen a situation where the state loses a monopoly on money. So it's very hard to say exactly what shape it takes. But I think the book does a really thorough job. It compares it to the um, the fall of, of chivalry 500 years ago. So I think it, 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 it paints an interesting picture. But in general, when you break the monopoly on money, all of a sudden governments are forced to acknowledge the preferences of their customers, right? That's what, that's what competition does. Like as a producer in a free market, you have to listen to the preferences of your customers, otherwise they, they go to your competitors and you lose business and you die, right? It's a very Darwinian process. But when you're a monopolist and you know that customer has to accept whatever product you're pushing, no matter what, they have no say in the matter, all of a sudden your incentive is to just squeeze them. 
Like I'm going to provide you the lowest quality product just to keep things alive. And I'm going to maximize my profit margin. And that's exactly what uh, the current monetary system does, right? It just pumps out this system of confiscation, but gives people just enough to kind of keep buying their passivity as we saw with the UBI checks or, um, or make just enough uh, investments in infrastructure and police to like keep, people calm and happy. Whereas now governments are going to actually be forced to treat citizens like customers instead of slaves. Yeah. So one thing that I would like to add here is so states always have the uh, monopoly on violence. So yes, with the competition and money, they already have less power, but nevertheless, they have this whole structure with the police, with the laws where they can just push it through. So um, for me personally, I don't see it as, uh, as it's not free for the people when we have a state. So I very much like the concept of free private cities where there's like a contract that cannot be changed. And when you have any form of state, it's a majority that can then impose the will on others. Mm -hmm. So I would like to know your idea on that. <clears throat> I, I agree. And I think that's the way we're going. Um, because again when the the preferences we can think of another way to think about it is that money is the medium that communicates our preferences like we think at least like here in the u.s people think you go out and vote and that's how you communicate your preferences but that doesn't matter actually like voting is it's almost meaningless like i'll give it maybe a little bit at the localized level, like you can go out and get grassroots involved with your community or local government and create some, some meaningful change. But as far as voting for president, that, that doesn't mean shit. That doesn't accomplish nothing in the U.S. The vote that matters is how you spend your money. Because how you spend your money is where you're investing your time and energy, right? That's what it's a, a reflection of. So when we see that our preferences aren't being communicated adequately through the monetary system as they're not in fiat, right? This is price signal distortion is this, I think pisses people off at a very kind of deep level. Like not even some, again, this is not cognitive. This is just free market participants are building up this tension and that, um, where they spend their money and investments they make, they, are they, it's not, uh, there's malinvestments occurring, right? Preferences aren't being satisfied through investment. So there's this buildup of tension and it ultimately just kind of erupts. Um, so when we get away from that system where people's vote and voice is being muted or manipulated through distortion in the money supply, and we get to something that um, preferences are being communicated clearly, right? and where there's a great clarity of market communication to the price signal, I think you see we move from a world with 200 countries to one with more like 20,000, right? There's, there's not one size fits all in the world. There's, if anything, there's a lot of different flavors of people and culture and all this. And I think you would just see government return to this localized kind of protection racket. Uh, but it wouldn't be a racket anymore because it would be consensual, right? You actually go and establish a, a contract with this free private city or citadel and agree to pay a certain tax rate for a certain set of a la carte services. And all of a sudden you're a customer again, you're being treated with respect. They want your business, right? This, and the difference is clear, right? Go and go into an Apple store and see how you're treated versus going to the DMV. Mm -hmm. Right, that's the difference between a free market and how a monopoly treats you. And that's so we're moving away from where the government treats you like the DMV towards something that treats you more like the Apple Store. Yeah, totally. Robert, you hit the nerve of this. This you know the focus of of, of today's episode because you know after t after having these fantastic conversations you know with Jeff Poo, Titus Gable of Free Private Cities, and Grant Romont of Ocean Builders. This is exactly the, the direction I want to take. And I know you don't have much time today. So, you know, before we ask, you know, like how can we facilitate or maybe even accelerate this process of really creating new structures with it, be whatever you want to call them. You just said, you know, Citadel, free private cities, sea pods, land-based pods, but embedded within that structure. 
with deflationary economics, with technology. And let me let me before uh, we go into this direction. Uh, you know, I love your article because it it made me so much to think because you talk about like time theft of labor, right? And time, I mean, systematic theft. And one of the listeners or followers, you know, wanted to ask you like, how do you calculate it? But it's pretty clear to me how you calculate that. Um, maybe you can, you know, uh, say, uh, comment a little bit about this. But what I want to know, like, uh, when it comes to systematic theft over such a long time, I mean, it's incredible long time, trillions of hours or whatever, like manpower. Mm -hmm. There's there's a layer, like a holistic layer above that, which I would call, I mean, how much technological innovation and, uh, you know, and civilizational evolution has been actually stolen, not only individually, but as a society and as a civilization. And this is what I want to say, you know, it's like, in concrete, like action, human action, uh, what if what if the right people come together, like the entrepreneurs, the investors, the libertarians, the freedom seeking people, the Bitcoiners, and come together and create sort of a, you know, whatever you want to call it, special economic zone, free private cities, where we create, you know, leading with a good example, what it would look like on a daily basis for the average person out there living in the opposite of a slave-like, you know, society. Do you know what I'm getting at? Yeah, so, um, sorry, just making a couple of notes so I don't lose the question again. So the first thing on the, the data, for the, the calculation of time theft, that's in the piece. There's actually a link to a spreadsheet. Um, and to give you just a rough conception of the, the time stolen by the Fed, what I essentially used was the change in US M2 over the past 40 years. I think the data went back to 1981. So um, I annualized 2020. So basically just said, and actually, no, I used uh, the budget office estimates for the end of 2020 with the total deficit, total money supply change uh, they projected. And then I took that and said, okay, so the Fed's printing this much money each year or creating this much uh, new money supply, let's say the banking system. And there's, a, there's also an average hourly wage rate posted by the Social Security Administration here in the U.S., so you can then just do a quick division and calculate how many hours the Fed is printing, right? If I'm printing a, a, a billion dollars and everyone costs uh, $10 an hour is the average rate, I just, I just printed 10 million human labor hours, right? I can now redeem this cash for 10 million hours worth of, um, I'm sorry, 100 million hours worth of, of human labor. So that was the calculation. And then I ran it for 40 years and the, the output was, I think, 23.4 billion hours stolen per year by just the Fed. This is not counting any other central bank for 40 years straight. So that was the average. Um, and that was, that came to a total of almost 1 trillion hours in just 40 years. And then when you, I compared that to, just to get an idea of the, how much labor that is, there was a line from Herodotus in, in Heroes of History by Will Durant. He said, each great pyramid required 100,000 men laboring for 20 years straight, which came out to 10 billion labor hours to build a single great pyramid. So the Fed's stealing enough hours per year, in theory, to construct almost two and a half great pyramids per year, which is equivalent to enslaving a workforce of slaves of 11.7 million people for 40 years straight. So full-time equivalents at 2,000 hours a year. So that was just mind boggling. Um, and it gives you a sense of that this is not, if we call it a system of slavery, clearly it's different than physical bondage, right? It's not as, as visual and visceral. However, because of its invisibility or relative invisibility, it can be operated a much larger scale, right? And the numbers bear that out. Um, and then it, it's to your part of the question about how to accelerate development of free private cities or, or demonopolization of money, I, I, I don't think there's any better way than to buy Bitcoin, study Bitcoin, and 
filter the the truth that you find through your own lens for others. Uh, this amazing thing about Bitcoin is that everyone that's really studied it deeply, we kind of land on the same truth, which I would call 21 million, right? It's kind of like the unshakable motif. But we all interpret it in a different way, right? Some people may call it an inflation hedge. Some people may call it a tool for freedom. Some people may think it's uh, a libertarian, you know, parallel monetary system, all these different interpretations. But by studying it closely, I think you not only enrich your own understanding of the world, because you're studying the history of money and money touches everything, um, but you're by sharing that interpretation of the world, I think you're also getting it into different cultural pockets or, you know, this, you may help this group of people see it a certain way. So I think that's how, that's the best way to accelerate this, uh, towards this brighter tomorrow. I think literally by buying and holding Bitcoin, by putting your savings into Bitcoin, you are, it's, you can think of it like every incremental unit of demand to hold Bitcoin is in decrement to reservation demand for fiat currency. So we're actually defunding the fiat currency complex by holding our savings in Bitcoin. And then by just, again, sharing this, uh, this knowledge, I think that so many people are, are waking up to, you're, you're actively participating um, in this change. Now, was well, there a third part to the question? I yeah, know. You, you know why I ask you that? Because you might have uh, seen maybe some of my tweet, tweet posts. We are together with Stephanie and with many other Bitcoiners and from the film experienced people who have already made you know hard money for Richard James and other people. Mm -hmm. We're working on a, on a film project. And I'm like, why can't we focus just for the first five to 10 minutes of the trailer, the teaser for this film project? And I want to go solution focused, visualize all this comprehension, this beautiful comprehension that you have like communicated, like what would be the, like the first images, emotions, uh, visualizations, uh, understanding what it would be like for the really normal average person out there, you know, cause I mean, let's be honest. I mean, how much of a smallest fraction of humanity really, uh, you know, is into the rabbit hole of Bitcoin. And, you know, we can tell them buy Bitcoin, you know, and, you know, everything. But, but um, I'm, I'm just, you know, I just want to, I'm just curious to, you know, know your like inspirational thoughts or vision or ideas. How could we visualize that? Like, what, what would we be like, you know, deflation economics, deflation technologies, such as Jeff Booth said, uh, the structural, you know, like protection of property yeah. rights, liberty, safety, security, everything that actually a government should be doing private contractual partners could do that much better, faster, more efficient, and better. Um, I've thought about this too, actually. I think there is room in the market for a documentary, we'll, we'll call it, that explains money from first principles, explains why gold was selected, explains how governments co-opted gold, and how Bitcoin sort of restores balance. Um, and I, I mean, I'm no, I'm no filmmaker, <laughs> but I think that the thing that gets people really passionate and inspired about Bitcoin is that it is disruptive to global war. Like you actually, you study the history of money and it is intimately intertwined with the history of warfare. Like people have been fighting and killing and deceiving each other over the money for as long as we've been walking, right? It's, it's really, it's really bad. Um, and I think that's how you mobilize people too, because nobody, no civilization likes war, right? They get ideologically twisted into it. Um, and we talked about this a bit on the podcast last night that I really think there are quite effective dark arts being practiced at the geopolitical level to pull the ideological strings of humanity, right? They know how to kind of pluck this right here, pull this here, always getting people to look away from the root cause to distract them with any social symptom. Um, but I, I, I do think that people in general could would more or less agree and cons, you know consensual that's another point of general um consensus in the world is that warfare is not good 
right? It's just not good. It's, it's very anti-economic. It's culturally destructive. It leaves scars, intergenerational scars. Um, I think that's the story that needs to be told. It's like Bitcoin is disruptive to gold, government, and global warfare. And all, those, all three of those are very intimately connected, right? Government, as we know it, only exists because it's monopolized gold. Gold only exists because of its monetary properties in the free market. Bitcoin is disruptive to, it better satisfies the properties of money by a hundred, possibly a thousand X than gold. So it's literally pulling the rug out from under this whole, in, a, in many ways, the whole history of humanity. And what that tomorrow looks like, who knows? But we can say with the general trajectory is less violent, uh, more productive, right? More, more free trade, which means more wealth creation. So that's the story I think needs to be told. And the deflationary economics, you know what I'm saying? Like people would for the first time see, I mean, who would object to, uh, you know, to deflationary economics where people pay less and less for right. better, more innovative products. Right. This is like my vision. Maybe I'm too obsessed with this idea. Like, okay, you know, how can I communicate why I'm so, or why whatever we are obsessed with Bitcoin? Why That's we right. have such a huge degree of conviction, trust? It's beyond belief. It's like the comprehension of why is Bitcoin? Why are we so obsessed with Bitcoin? What does it mean for, you know, to live in a hyper Bitcoinized or whatever Bitcoinized world? Yeah. Well, we trust Bitcoin so much because it's 0% trust and 100% verification, right? <laughs> yeah. So we're removing the political or interpersonal element from money. And that's the, that's the game changer. Like the, to depoliticize money, it's never been possible for Bitcoin. Um, and I, I agree. Deflationary economics are huge. Like if we can help people understand that price increases year over year are not natural, and are indeed an expression of the government robbing them slowly, surreptitiously at first, and then very suddenly. Um, that can mobilize people on a large scale. But it's hard, it's, really, it's hard because educational system has obfuscated all Austrian economics, as we know, and people have never lived through this. No, there's no yeah. historical example to point yeah. toward. You can yeah. kind of point toward 19th century gold standard, but no one remembers that shit. You know, it's... yeah. And this is so what I'm concerned about, Robert, you know, like, I don't want to, you know, uh, my intention is not like to give us utopian, you know, sci-fi bullshit. It's like, this is, this, this could be reality, maybe, but maybe people are so brainwashed, so indoctrinated, so fearful, so, no. you know, programmed that it might be a little bit difficult to sell, to pitch this reality, you know? This is why it is difficult. I 100% agree. But the wind in our sails is number go up technology. <laughs> and there's nothing, you know, <laughs> numbers don't lie. So Bitcoin is a true unmanipulable barometer for the failure of central banking and the state. All right, the higher that number goes, again, one of the definitions I, I give of Bitcoin is an insurance policy on central banking, the legacy infrastructure of central banking. So the higher the, that policy price is, the more likely the legacy system is to collapse. And I just think that we were all sucked in by number go up. That pattern is not going to stop. So it's important for us now to build good narrative bedrock, right? Like what Bitcoin really is um, and build this, this strong minority around it, which yeah. you know, arguably we already have, but it's only going to get bigger over time. Um, that is the force that breaks government. You know? yeah. It's like you can't fight the people. Robert, I think your article should be really broken down in a kid's version for seven-year-old people, for seven-year-old <laughs> maturely thinking kids, seriously. I mean, uh, your article, really, I had to read it like three times because, <laughs> so before uh, um, I go into, into a tangent, um, Stephanie, uh, you wanted to add something. <laughs> yes, I would like to add something. <laughs> so you were talking about war financing or war over money. So um, I would just like to add a quote by Axel Weber, who was a former president of the German Bundesbank, German Central Bank. And he said that central banks were introduced to provide war financing to governments. Right. That's right. 
Yeah. So when I'm telling this to people and that Axel Weber was like saying this, this is kind of mind blowing for many. And I do see that more and more people are waking up and that's important that we already did the groundwork. So they have the right um, articles, the right facts, the right resources to have a look at, to make a change. So one thing, I would, yeah, one thing I would like to ask you is you were writing in your article, owning 20% of the global gold supply gives the central banks significant influence over its price, over the gold price, which they actively with which they actively suppress the paper market. So you say that the central banks influence the gold price. So here I was wondering, like how strong is the ability of central banks to manipulate prices to um, kind of suppress alternative technologies apart from prohibition? And why aren't they doing this with Bitcoin? Maybe in secret, they could buy Bitcoin and manipulate the markets. So um, what are your thoughts on this? And um, maybe a little bit more in depth, why, I mean, we could use gold in general for, for uh, as a money, you know, um, it's just tax. So this is, this is one of the reasons why I think it is not used as a money. So the first year you hold it, it is tax, but actually you could nevertheless, um, you know, use it for um, some payments. But, you know, when you go shopping all the time, the velocity is much higher than just using it once per year. So this is the problem with that. So this is my reason why I think gold isn't used as a money. It's because of the tax reason. So you brought another aspect in, in here and maybe you could like explain this a little bit more and also in perspective of Bitcoin. Yeah, those are good observations. Um, I think I'd like to say first about central banking is it is indeed uh, an institution introduced to finance government war efforts. Um, and actually even beyond that, and I think Gary North says this in his books, or in his book, Honest Money, there's no such thing as price controls. There's only people controls. So the price, right, of any market good is the social consensus in that moment of the cumulative actions of buyers and sellers, you know, self-sovereign individuals acting in their own best interest worldwide. That's what moves the price of any particular good. But when you introduce a central bank on top of that, all of a sudden they, price goes from being a matter of expressing the collective logos to a matter of policy, right? To expressing a, a, a the agenda of a, a small, set of central bank governors, basically. So it is, and that's why it was the fifth measure in Marxist playbook, right? Because if you're gonna engage in socialism and you're gonna centrally control the entire economy, and, and in Soviet Russia, they had price controls for everything, right? It was a purely command and control economy. That, it, that what I argue in the piece, that's, you're suppressing the logos. And the logos, again, is that inviolable principle of reason that we use. We often associate it with language, but it's also associated with uh, prices, right? And prices, again, are this entrepreneurial telecommunication system we all use, whether we know it or not. And if you drill down into that word a little bit, the word logos, it's actually a Greek word that means word or term. Uh, I'm sorry, word or ratio. And so logos is actually expressed, you know, the divine spark within us is expressed in our language, but it's also expressed in, in ratios and prices are just ratios of exchange, right? Instead of saying how many houses a car costs or how many cars a hot tub costs, we just express it in money. So it, 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 the price itself is an expression of the collective logos. And when you introduce a central bank on top of that, it's just like introducing a dictator that's trying to suppress the freedom of speech, right? It wants to shut down this media outlet or, or squash this voice of dissent. And central banks have engaged, there's a great website called gata.org, G-A-T-A.org, and that's the gold antitrust task force or something like that, I forget the acronym. And they just go through the history of central bank manipulation in the gold markets, right? The big one that jumps out is the, the London gold pool. 
uh, that was used, I think it's maybe still active. Um, and there's been all these other schemes where central banks have engaged in rehypothecation and financialization of gold to suppress its price in the paper markets, to control its price, frankly. Because if the price ascends too quickly, people would just leave their currency and exit into gold. Um, so what government, and that's, to rewind the clock again, that's why we had like executive order 6102, right? Government comes in, confiscates all the gold, then they let it reprice so that they benefit from that repricing. But that still is, it's just antithetical to free market capitalism to tell someone they can't use this money, they have to use that money. Um, and to the last part of the question of why we can't use gold as a monetary base, I, I say that maybe we could if you had all of these vaults relatively distributed um, and they were being audited and reserves proven in real time via cryptography, but it would just take, there'd be a lot of infrastructure necessary on top of a gold-based financial system to make it anywhere near as trust minimized as Bitcoin. So there'd be a huge cost to maybe get close to the trust minimization of Bitcoin and you still wouldn't have removed the incentive to violence, even geopolitical violence, right? Where country A says, well, we're going to go blow up country B and take their gold. Like you can't, well, you can't eliminate that. The, the physicality of gold uh, makes that a constant. So that's why I think Bitcoin just wins, right? It's the most energy efficient infrastructure for settling transactions in a trust minimized manner. And you can, no one can do anything about that. It just, it already is. It's got the greatest liquidity, greatest network effects. It's perfected all five properties of money. So there's no, um, there's no chink in the armor left for a, a technology to disrupt it. Um, and even if there's some unforeseen feature that we don't contemplate for money, um, you know, we have this market battleground we called altcoin space and anything that may work there, like if the market starts to select for some feature, Bitcoin does have the capacity to incorporate that feature into its open source software. So it seems like not only is Bitcoin exponentially better than gold, but it's also adaptive, right? It can get smarter, it can get stronger, um, which is, you know, just makes it seem to be indomitable in the marketplace. Yeah, so I also see Bitcoin as superior, especially because you can um, have it in self-custody and send it over distance. And this is why That's you right. need to have this custody provider. And if you hold it at a custody provider, you can um, always check over the network whether your Bitcoins are still on the address where they're holding it on your behalf. So yep. um, this for sure, it's um, much superior. It was just a question why aren't the people already like jumping on gold because there's so much inflation so maybe it's also because like you know using it as cash they could have done this or why aren't they using bitcoin earlier i mean that would have why is it not there already so i was thinking maybe it's because um people are just not realizing it and more and more people are waking up now um and now the pressure is just getting more in, more increased, much more increased in an actually radical fashion because they're printing like crazy. We haven't had this before. So right mm -hmm. now it's the time you said it was always gradual and now it's kind of exponential right now. So this right. could be the trigger to really make this change then. Yeah, I, I agree. The currency system only Days, right so it requires our expansion of the money supply at a higher and higher rate just to remain sustainable and at some point the currency just breaks down and the funny thing about as far as why people haven't adopted i think it's just widespread ignorance about the nature of money so mm -hmm. people you really see people just using whatever the system is until it collapses and they stampede into something else and very few people have learned this lesson it seems um which is just interesting but I think that um, you can't stop a free market from zeroing in on truth over time, right? Even if you peddled this central bank monopoly for a hundred years and you've managed to keep it upright by manipulating the price of competitive technologies like gold, um, it comes apart eventually, right? You just can't. The truth is that inflation is theft, 
that is the truth. That's the bottom of that, that narrative. And people don't like to be stolen from. That's the bottom of that narrative. The market will figure that out eventually. Um, and I, I, as I argue in the piece, I just, and you, I guess the counter argument could be this is naive optimism relative to what we're seeing in the world, but I feel and believe as though markets are becoming more efficient at this truth finding function by virtue of digital technology. Mm. Like you just can't hide shit as well, right? WikiLeaks, Arab Spring Uprising, George Floyd protests, the digital age has this uh, multiplicity of windows, right, through which we view the world. And if truth is the end of inquiry, all of a sudden our inquiry has been accelerated uh, exponentially, right? We can all inquire about things. We have the, the, the library of the world at our fingertips. Um, this is just, it's shattering and incinerating these in, anachronistic institutions like central banking, mainstream media, uh, you know, it's already happened in the music industry. Like we, all of these old school trust institutions that were basically siphoning attacks off of transactions, but were necessary in the analog age to preserve trust are at risk from distributed software. Uh, and this is just, you know, Bitcoin being disruptive to gold is the latest and greatest test of the, the disruptive potential of digital tech. Because here we have gold, which makes the world go round, right? It's what central banks denominate themselves in and settle with one another in, ultimately. Right. If you go to war, I don't want your SDRs. I don't want your currency. I want your gold. Right. So it literally is the technology at the bedrock of the institution that runs the world. And now that's being disrupted by open source distributed tech. Mm -hmm. And that's why the future is so opaque, because we have no idea what this looks like. Mm -hmm. We only know what the world looks like going around with gold as its base layer. We don't know what Bitcoin can do. Mm -hmm. um, but we believe that it's a net positive for humanity. Robert, you know, uh, Stephanie got in her Twitter handle. Uh, if you look at her profile, only truth shall set you free. You know, so as mm -hmm. the saying goes. So, you know, these the symptoms, you know, you just heard about what is it called Finchen or all these unelected, you know, institutions that uh, the, the bank, central banks money laundering like in trillions. It's just a symptom. It's mm -hmm. just even, you know, a fraction of this is the tip of the iceberg. But, you know, I'm really, I'm really thankful, you know, that you have been waiting for someone like you that articulated, you know, all this anger, despair I have about central banks <laughs> in your article. And I think everybody should read that masters and slaves of money. And um, yeah, I want to thank you so much for taking your time. I want to respect your time. Is there anything you want to add or we've forgotten to mention is really important to emphasize in these dictatorial times? <laughs> Um, no, I mean, just the best investment you can make is study, frankly, like just study. I always tell people the, the way down the rabbit hole, the proverbial Bitcoin rabbit hole is the question, what is money? Like, just keep asking that question relentlessly. Even when you think you've got it figured out, just keep asking. And I promise you'll, you'll get new answers. I still get new answers. I still don't know what money is. It's the, uh, the, I kind of consider money to be economic water and water is like organic money. Like we, everything in the universe is a transaction and it's mediated by something. It's mediated by a substance and that substance becomes the most important thing because it's the thing through which all uh, transactions occur. Right? So, it, it's almost like exchange. What is it? What do they say about uh, change is the only thing that never changes, right? That's like the universal constant. But all change is driven by exchange, and all exchange is driven by a medium of exchange. So whether it's water, whether it's money, whether it's air, whether it's space, like it's a very fundamental concept <laughs> to existence, like to the nature of being itself. So I'm like I encourage people to just. Add, I think it's interesting in its simplicity. Like you can think, oh, I figured it out. It's just a medium of exchange, just what Austrian said. Mm. Um, but then all of a sudden you're like, well, what about store value? Like, you know, your store value too is a medium of exchange, but you're trading with your future self, right? <laughs> you're saying, I'm gonna forego the, the opportunity cost this money 
or the, the opportunities this money could realize for me today to hold it for future use, for future self to do something greater. So that's just the drum I'm beating now. Um, instead of trying to just explicitly educate people and walk them through my own worldview, I'm like, go and, go and discover it for yourself. Just ask yourself the question, what is money? Um, ask it assiduously and see what truth emerges. Right. Um, Stephanie, did you want to like um, add something before we wrap up? Because I wanted to ask Robert, like, because this was one of the questions of the of the of one of the uh, guys on twi Twitter, uh, he wanted to ask you if there were like citadels everywhere, where would you move to? Like, where would you prefer to? <laughs> <laughs> Panama or whatever? Or <laughs> I mean, that would all the devil's in the details, right? I'd have to negotiate with the Citadel to make sure I get the right price, right services at the right price. But if it's just in terms of geography, I like places near the coast, low humidity, um, good surfing, good snorkeling, somewhere like that. Sounds like a dream. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Stephanie, did you want to add some things before we wrap up? Yeah. Well, maybe one thing. Um, so when people are investigating articles of authors, um, it is important to always know that you don't have to agree with everything in order to find something useful for you. So um, it's a good idea to check out different views, different articles, take what resonates, what feels right for you or what helps you, and always um, verify it on your own and never just mm -hmm. blindly trust anyone. Absolutely. And I would say, including yourself, you may think you have something very figured out and like it's a it's a core pillar to your belief system. But if you follow that question, what is money? And you're just 99% of people, some of those pillars are going to get blown out, right? You're going to have some fundamental reshaping of your worldview. So I, I, I think open mindedness, I think in my, in my value hierarchy, like freedom is very high. And open mindedness is very close. Like it's very, you have to be free within yourself too. You can't tyrannize yourself. Like I just believe this because I've always believed it. Like you need to ask yourself why you believe that. Um, so I agree completely. So Robert, thank you so much. You're really huge service to humanity. I really want to thank you for all your work. Oh, you're thank doing. you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean it's uh, yeah beyond description. So. Uh, Robert, um, yeah, hope to, you know, have the have this kind of talks maybe in, sometime in the future and enjoy your weekend. Thanks so much. Thanks, again. guys. Thanks, okay. Stephanie. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. It was really great. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, Rod. Bye, guys. Okay, Stephanie, are you still here? I, I can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why, why don't we, you know, just uh, sort of as a reflection process, it's, it's every time it's amazing how much I learn, not only through reading your articles and everybody's articles. I mean, I wish I was, you know, half as articulated as you guys when it comes to writing. But um, I learned a lot because uh, that's, this is this like the core question. I, uh, and, and I got this, you know, beautiful answer from him. It's like showing people like how like deeply disruptive whatever we would call it, disruptive or uh, like, like bringing this, 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 uh, this, this, this balance into our, you know, into a ethical, uh, rational and, and human friendly order. Right. So, and now I have a little bit more inspirations and, and, and ideas, how we can convert, translate the opposite, you know, of, of course, you know, it's when, when we say, okay, you know, this fiat system, uh, this, the central banking system is actually, uh, you know, is a funding pro is a funding system for governments and wars. I mean, in, in violence and aggression. You know, I mean, it just, you know, perpetrates it by order of magnitude. What do you, what, okay? What did you, you know, just learn for for yourself, like out of this discussion? Oh wow, I learned a lot. Um, well, where to start? I really like um, how Robert explains things in a um, very holistic, wide view incorporating not only the technical things but also the values what is what is what makes us human um the importance of freedom and self sovereignty so that's just amazing and yeah of course i learned uh, some more details as well yeah 
One thing, yeah, one thing I wanted to add now, I got it again, is that um, it's not only now we have this technology and we have this vision of the future, but for really making this a reality, we need to focus our thoughts and our actions on that. And also by um, educating other people to what is like real truth or what, where were we lied to essentially. Um, and debunking all the, all the lies that the Fed and the central authorities, governments have set up to enslave us. This is what it's about. Because essentially, it is about our thoughts, our mind, our emotions. This is what creates reality. So when, when like, let's say there are like only 100 people that be believe in Bitcoin and the others are just not listening or they are not um, get, they're not having access to this content, then it doesn't work right? So the people really have to change from within or be open-minded within and be um, able to see these things and know their own true power of their thoughts and their emotions and their actions, because this is what the future will be like. Exactly. And we have sown the seeds, you know, maybe sometimes I have to remind myself, it just takes time, this process of you know, being able to reflect, to you know, contemplate, to go into the rabbit hole. People's most people maybe are just maybe they're about to become ready this is what i'm trying to say maybe you know through all this dictatorial i mean it's insane what's going on stephanie in austria yeah we have i'm at this birthday party of my girlfriend's brother and where you can't have more than 10 people you know within in a, inside a house you know I mean, even with social distance i mean it's it's crazy insane and now you have to there's going to be a law soon where you go to a restaurant and uh and, and you have to, you know, sort of identify yourself, do a sort of a KYC process, because whatever suspicion of, you know, if there's a suspicion of whatever or, or infection of whatever COVID, you know, hysterical bullshit. So, um, I mean, I don't want to play it down. I'm just saying, is this really the reality we're in? <laughs> this is going into central planned communism. This is, this is it. Destruction of exis existences, you know, insolvencies. People are losing, I mean, their their jobs, their businesses, and and the value. Mm, yeah. Yeah, this is what we're going into. So it's very, for understanding what's happening right now, it's so important what the state really is. So I can really recommend to everyone reading Anatomy of the State by Rothbard, mm -hmm. because then you understand the foundational structure of a state. And Rothbard says it's a parasitic entity that enslaves its people essentially. And it does so by using complex and very refined propaganda mechanisms to make the people think that the state would be something good for them. They protect them, we have the social state and everything. But essentially we could have all these things without the state imposing its will on us. Yeah. And just uh, just a shout out because it's um, I just recently saw it yesterday or so. Uh, there's a new, really super made low budget film by Richard James who who made the film this video Hard Money. You should definitely watch. It's called Anatomy An Anatomy of the State, based on Rothbard's book. And I think it's Guy Swan's uh, voice or Guy Swan's voice. Um, no, no. And and I think yeah, also maybe you know what what the what the f you know happened nineteen seventy one and other contributors. Really good it, with beautiful original footages you know of the early twentieth century or animations. It really breaks it down. Yeah. So shout out to Richard James and others. That's great. I'll have a look at it. I saw it already, but I didn't. Have yeah. To yeah. <laughs> okay, Stephanie, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure, you know, to uh, listen to your, you know, your thoughts, your, your comprehension, your knowledge, and have a good weekend. Thank you. You too. What's great. <laughs> Bye. Ciao.